We thank you, Father, for this house that you have provided for us here at First Baptist Tuscaloosa, and we ask for a double portion of your blessing on the pastor and the ministry here, Father God, and we thank you. We do not take it for granted. Lord God, we ask you to give us ears to hear and a heart to receive because you told us that we would have ears but would not be hearing. We would have eyes but not be perceiving, but we ask that that veil be lifted, Father God, as we build and deepen our relationship with Messiah and that we would have that understanding that you promised us through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Father God, we ask you to bring us together as one, as we lift up one voice, one heart, and one spirit to lift up the name of Jesus, the name above all names, and dedicate this time to you and give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in Exodus chapter 29. I'm sorry, chapter 19. In verse 13, Lo tiga bo yad kisako yisakel o yaro yare im behema im ish lo yehe bimshok hoyed hema ya alo vahar. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up the mountain. This is God speaking from the mountain, speaking from Mount Sinai to the people. And he's telling them, just like we see going on in major cities all around America, we saw that wall all around the capital, right? He built barriers. He didn't want people to come up the mountain. He wanted them to come to the mountain. Now, isn't it interesting, a concept that he wants us to come to the mountain, but we don't have to go up the mountain in order to hear the Lord. But each one of us should be making that pilgrimage to the mountain so that we can hear the Lord, to be in the Lord's presence. And so he set it up this way, and he said he wants none to come up the mountain but the one he calls. But you read Moshe min ha'ar el ha'am ve'kadesh, Et ha'am ve'kabsu sim lotam. And Moses went down from the mount to the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. Remember, they hadn't washed their clothes in how long? It's now been 50 days since they left Egypt. We don't know what provisions were made for them, but we know that their clothes did not wear out. Their shoes did not wear out. There were no cobblers, there were no tailors, and God gave them an opportunity to cleanse themselves so that he could come into their presence. Who can go up the mountain of the Lord? The one with clean hands. And so you always see water. Every church you go to, there's water. Every synagogue you go through, there's water. Water for baptism, water for the lavable to wash your hands. They couldn't go into the tent of meeting until they washed their hands. So it's a cleansing. All right. Now what do we hear? COVID. What's the number one way to prevent COVID? Wash your hands. So all of a sudden you hear, oh, well, we're not under the law. Well, it seems to be a mandate that uh, there's places that say that you can't go in unless you Wash your hands. I went to the doctor the other day. I had to wear a mask. I had, to, I had to get my temperature taken and I had to wash my hands with the, with the uh, sanitizer before I could go in to meet with the doctor. It's all biblical. All of this is biblical. Had we been doing this all along, and if you take a look at how plagues have spread... Right? through uncleanness, had we maintained a certain amount of cleanness. Now, there are parts in the world where there is not fresh water. We support a ministry that's up on the top of the Ganges River. The Ganges River is filthy. And 30 million orphans live on the edge of the Ganges River without any housing. And 30 million children daily go into the water, but 30 million children do not come out of the water because that's what the crocodiles feed on. It's a problem in the world. Fresh water is a problem in the world. And here we are, we turn on the water. 
I'm one of those people that you brush your teeth. I don't let the water run. I turn the water off. Maybe you're one of those people that just lets the water run, 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 because you pay no attention to it. I pay attention to it. Because I remember the stories that my grandparents told me about how they had to carry water. So it stuck with me. It actually bothered me before I became a believer. That if I was, I was somebody in a, staying in a hotel uh, and they would let the water run while they brushed their teeth and the water was just running down the drain, running down, it would, it would bother me, it would irritate me. I would think, what a waste. When that cup of water could be the difference between life and death for somebody who lived in Africa. Vayamer el ha'am heyu nikonim lish loshet yamim al tigshu el isha. Isha means woman. And he said to the people, be ready by the third day, do not come near a woman. Now, how many times do you keep hearing about the third day, 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 the third day? How many of you have heard the band, The Third Day? Okay. Ty Anderson, who plays for them, is a Jewish believer from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, has been part of the band since the beginning. Vahi vayom hashlishi bichiyot haboker vayi Kilot overekim, ve anan kaved al haar ve kol shofar, chazak meod, ve achored kol haam asher bamachane. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the sound of a shofar, exceedingly loud, so all the people in the camp who were in the camp trembled. Sounds like Acts chapter 2 to me. Sound like Acts chapter 2 to you? The upper room? There was a loud shofar blast. There were tongues of fire. There was a rumbling. There was a move. This is the giving of the law and giving of the Spirit the same day, 50 days after the Exodus, 50 days after the resurrection. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. They sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. The people immediately prepared for the revelation of God that was promised for the third day. God was going to reveal himself on the third day. What day did Jesus rise? See, we're being prepared in the beginning for an understanding of the significance of first fruits. First fruits is the third day after the Passover. So the lamb is slaughtered and on the third day is first fruits. That's in Leviticus 23. When you think about Genesis 22, it was on the third day that Abraham and Isaac ascended the mountain. If you do a study on the third day, you'll find out that it holds great weight. Not so much in the creation story in the 14 verses in Genesis of creation, but what God has done and what God will do on the third day. He said, be ready for the third day. The meeting with God could only come at the third day. This was an absolute. The meeting with God could only come on the third day. God promised to reveal himself on the third day and they had to wait for it. Now, how many of you have ever read that before and said, well, now I know why Jesus rose on the third day. Now I know why Jesus was revealed on the third day. Now I know because God had established that he would reveal himself on the third day. It's right here in the book of Exodus. It tells you what is to come. That's why when I tell you that this is a book of prophecy, the Bible is a book of prophecy. 
It's not the story of creation. It's not the story of the heavens. It's not the story of God alone. It's a story of prophecy. And all throughout the scriptures, you're going to find prophetic statements like this. That when you stop long enough and you say, God promised to reveal himself on the third day and they had to wait for it. You hear that, you immediately go to the tomb. You immediately wait for that third day to arrive. Because Jesus said, tear this temple down and I will rebuild it in three days. Honestly, have any of you ever really seen this as a prophetic revelation of Jesus? And here it is in the book of Exodus. And so every time I want you to count, every time you hear somebody say, well, we need to do with that Old Testament. You're doing away with Jesus. You're doing away with the prophetic work of God. You're doing away with what God prepared you so you could receive Jesus and recognize if you study his word, God promised to reveal himself on the third day and they had to wait for it. He said, do not come near your wives. The rest of the scriptures do not teach that there's any inherent uncleanness in sexual relations. This command was peculiar for this event. In this situation, God wanted the people to demonstrate their desire for purity by putting on clean clothes, restraining desires, even legitimate desires. In the covenant between a man and a woman, a woman is not to deny herself her husband's advances. Her body is not her own according to scripture. But during this period of time, they had to separate. Now, what was the curse of the woman? The woman would have a desire for her husband. But God said, I want you to set this aside. I don't want you to have anything to do with anything but focusing on me. I want you to remain clean, chaste, and pure. Whether or not you'd been married 40 years, 50 years, whatever the amount of years you'd been married, I want you to stop, I want you to separate, and I want you to honor this time. Men must come before God with the best preparation that they can get. <clears throat> Thunderings and lightning in a thick cloud, these signs of power and glory signaled the presence of God. The whole environment spoke of God's presence in a terrifying sense. You picture yourself in the upper room. And all of a sudden you start hearing the sound of a shofar blast and tongues of fire and the rumblings. What would you think? You're sitting in your bedroom and all of a sudden coming through the window are tongues of fire. What would you think? You'd be petrified. This is how the Holy Spirit announced itself. It didn't come in in this still small voice. It came in with a rumble. It came in to say, I bring power. I bring authority. And I'm going to pour out my spirit on you. And now you'll be able to fulfill what Jesus promised. When he said, even you will, be do, you will do greater things than what you have seen me do. How many of you ever thought about that statement that Jesus made that you will do greater than he? How could I ever aspire to do greater than Jesus? Will I raise more dead? Will I heal more lepers? Will I make more lame walk? Well, with the advent of the internet, with the advent of our large congregations, guess what? That's happened. In the accounting of the seven years that I was at Bethlehem, there were more healings in total than there were in the Bible. Now, is that something that I'm going to put on a big neon sign driving down the highway? Is that something I'm going to take pride in? That's not me. That's the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit working through me. 
I did nothing but show up and did what God told me to do and said what God told me to say. So did I do greater than him? No. But did I carry out his wishes and did I fulfill what he empowered me to do? And the answer is yes. And isn't that what we're looking for? Signs and wonders that God is alive and present. People aren't returning to church because they did not see. In all the years they went to church, the kind of move of God that God expected them to see. And people have drifted away, and you know what? Their lives haven't changed that they know of. They think they're better off. They think they have more free time. They think they can go down to Perdido Bay and they can hang out down there. But you'll check in. All you have to do is open up the drawer. There's a Bible in that drawer. And you should enjoy yourself. God gave us this earth and gave us dominion over it. And if you're not taking advantage, if you're not going to see God's wonders and God's miracles, I've been to every one of the national parks because that was something that I thought was miraculous. That within our own nation, we had these parks where I could see the largest trees, the greatest canyons, the red rocks of Sedona. And so I made it a point to go there. Why? Because God gave it to me to enjoy. And in every place, I brought him the honor and the glory, and I sang his praises. Do we thank him for our breath? We don't. We should. The sound of the trumpet was very loud. What Israel saw and felt in the thunder, lightning, the cloud, the smoke, and the earthquake was terrifying. But each of these are natural, though frightening phenomena. Yet the sound of the trumpet did not come from the camp, but from heaven itself. No wonder that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Jesus will return when? At the last trumpet blast. Does that mean me standing on a hill somewhere like the Matterhorn with one of those big long uh, Ricola horns? No. We're going to hear that trumpet blast from heaven like they heard. You see, all of you are being prepared in the Old Testament for what is to come. Every event that is foretold will be fulfilled again. And all these are foreshadowings of what is to come. And if you're familiar with it, then you're going to be on the lookout for it. What sound has ever been heard other than what we call the shot that was heard around the world? That's a name. That shot wasn't heard around the world. But this shofar blast will be heard as it was from heaven. Moshe et Ha'am Likrat Ha'elohim, Min Hamachane, Vayit Yatsvu Betak Tit Ha'ar. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the lower part of the mount. Behar Sanai, Ashan Kulo, Mibne Asher Yarad Alav Adonai Ba'esh Ve'al. Ashano ki eshen hakivshan veyacharad kol ha'ar me'od. And Mount Sinai was altogether in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount trembled greatly. Did not the upper room tremble? Was there not the sound of a shofar? Was there not tongues of fire? All in preparation. The exact same description is given to us in the upper room as given to us on Mount Sinai. 
Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. At the sound of the trumpet, Moses led the people up to the barrier at the base of Mount Sinai where they could see, smell, hear, and virtually taste the fire which covered the mountain as well as feel the earth shake under their feet when the whole mountain quaked greatly. But he called Hashofar Holek, Vekazek Meod Moshe Yedaber, Vecha Elohim Yanenu Vekol. And when the voice of the shofar sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. Vayered Adonai al Har Sinai, El Rosh Ha'ar Vayikra Adonai le Moshe, El Rosh Ha'ar Vayal Moshe. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. When the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, this is called Tekia Hagadol. There are three shofar blasts. Tekia, one long blast. Terua and Shevarim. Terua is a staccato, seven blasts. And then you have the Shevarim, which is so you have the long blast, and then the longest blast is called Tekia Hagadol. Gadol means large, Kitan means small. So when you go to Israel with me and you want to order a large coffee, they'll ask you, Kitan or Gadol? You want a small one, you want a large one. They won't ask you in English, they'll ask you in Hebrew. Because these are easy Hebrew words to learn. All right? They speak English better than me. So Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to the imminent, to the immediate presence of God. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord came down on top upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. God came in a special presence to Mount Sinai, ready to meet with Moses as a representative of the whole nation of Israel. So imagine the whole nation is gathered, two million are gathered. It's like an inauguration. And God calls Moses to come up the mountain. This is the confirmation. This is the same thing that God did with Jesus when he came up out of the water. And a spirit like a dove lit upon him and God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This was the inauguration of, of, of the confirmation of Messiah's ministry. This was the confirmation that it was Moses who was God's representative. Everybody else was held back, but Moses was invited up. This established for all of Israel, once and for all, he was their leader, he was their prophet, he was their spokesman, he was God's man for the job. And they could grumble and they can question and they can be jealous of it, but nobody went up the mountain but Moses. And Moses went up, God came down and Moses went up as the people trembled in terror at the foot of the mountain. Moses needed courage to go to the top and meet with God. It took courage for Moses to go up in the midst of all the thunder, lightning, earthquake, fire, and smoke. Yet Moses knew God not only in terms of the awesomeness, pow awesomeness, uh, awesome power, but also in terms of his gracious kindness. In the Hebrew, it's called Lev Elohim, the heart of God. Many of you are unfamiliar with the heart of God. The heart of God is love, for God is love. The heart of God is benevolent, long-suffering. When you start reading through the rebellion and through the backsliding and through the paganry of all of Israel, when you read in Jeremiah and you read in Nehemiah and you read about Ezra and you read about Ezekiel, 
in the valley of dry bones. God makes the statement, he says, I do not do this for your sake. I do not do this because you did something to deserve it or to earn it. I do this for my sake. I created you as my people. And if I placed you in an environment where it's not clear to you of my love, then I must do something to demonstrate to you something so magnificent that you will know of my great love for you. I may have shared this story with you before, but I received a promotion, moved from Atlanta to Los Angeles and, uh, for AT&T. And I was made the national sales manager after, after divestiture of, of uh, all the companies in the general telephone territory that we could never sell to before because there was a rule that AT&T could not encroach upon general telephone territory. So they needed a new sales manager and a new sales force to go into the general telephone customers and tell them about AT&T and tell them about our services. And they made me the national sales manager over that group. And I felt like uh, Captain Pometer of F Troop. Remember that show? They gave me 128 of the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst. But we had a system called certification. In order for you to be promoted from a salesman to an industry consultant to move up through the ranks, you had to be able to sell by, based on our structure. You had to identify a business problem. You had to use our products as a solution. You had to cost justify it, and you had to have the client sign off on the fact that the benefit was there and that that's how the sale was made. Now, I was responsible for receiving these packages, interviewing the sales rep, having them tell me the story about how they made the sale, and then I would sign off on it. And I got a call one day from Human Resources, and they brought me in front of them, and they had a panel there, and I was surprised. And I said, what's this about? And they said, well, you certified a sale, but, um, Somebody here happens to know the owner and call him up to congratulate him and say, hey, that's great that you are getting all these benefits. And he didn't know what he was talking about. So you had one of your salesmen falsify the way he made the sale. I said, well, I'll immediately take, I'll immediately take action against that. And they said, no, we will immediately take action against that you will be demoted one level for six months and i said i'll be demoted for six months that's correct your pay will be adjusted your position will be adjusted and i said why they said because obviously you did not create an environment within your sales force to understand that this kind of behavior is not acceptable and the standard you set was not tight enough, was not clear enough that anybody could violate it without being fearful of consequences. So we're gonna terminate that person, but we're gonna demote you. And I left very upset. But you know what? I came to the Lord and I got it. Came to the Lord many years later. And that story was brought to my remembrance that I hadn't created an environment where it was clear that the boundaries could not be crossed and that any, any kind of offense, shortcuts, falsifications of any kind would be dealt with immediately by immediate termination. And I'm Given that message the first time that I met with my sales force, that probably would have never happened. This is what God did. God established a set of rules that says, don't cross this line. 
And I'm going to set these rules up not for my sake, but for your sake, because it's not healthy. It's not beneficial. This guy lost his job. I lost six months of income. There's consequences. I was reinstated after six months. I did my time in the penalty box, just like at a hockey game. And I learned my lesson. And so expectations were made clear. And I understood God's message that says 99% obedient is 100% disobedient. God gave his all on that cross. Not some, all. Not 99.9% .9 of Messiah, but all of Messiah. And that's the standard he set for us. Now, is that legal? Legalism? No. 613 commands in the Old Testament, 1,250 commands in the New Testament. When Jesus spoke, he was not making suggestions. When Jesus spoke, he wasn't saying, well, you know, you can do it your way, but this is a better way. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. If you cannot forgive your brother, I cannot forgive you. My Father in heaven cannot forgive you, period. Not a suggestion. Not when you're ready. Not after you've pled your case about how terrible a thing they've done to you and you've got all kinds of people worked up and then you finally say, well, I guess because God says I have to forgive them, I have to forgive them. No, he wants it from the heart. And because we're people, we like boundaries. We like them. We like boundaries in our home. How many of you, when your mother told you, don't touch the stove, it's hot. How many of you touch the stove? Come on. Let's go. Let's be honest. Okay. Over half of us are honest. The other half, well, <clears throat> I'd like to meet your father, Geppetto. But we did that. How many of you broke curfew? How many of you drove when you shouldn't drive? How many of you drank, you drank and you drove? How many of you, look at all of us, all of us did these things. Was it because God wanted to punish us and make life horrible for us and have our parents be legalistic? No. It was for our safety, it was for our benefit, it was because they loved us. Hebrews tells us that no father disciplines a child he doesn't, he doesn't love. If your father didn't discipline you, it's because he didn't love you. It's not a matter of legalism, it's a matter of boundaries and wisdom. How many of you have ever made the statement, if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done that. I want to see a show of hands, okay? And if every hand is up, you need to leave. But you know what? It had to be this way. You had to have the experiences you had to be in this room at this time, at this moment, to hear this word. So nothing could have changed. So you can't live with the regret that you didn't do it the other way. It's what got you here. And God wants you to live a life without regret. Yes, he wants you to look back and we are overcomers by the word of our testimony. That's what we've done since we came to the Lord. We all started in the same place. Naked and busted you came into this world and naked and busted you're gone out. That's what you do in the meantime. But God knew, Moses knew God in terms of his gracious kindness. God wants you to have the things you want. He wants you to live the life he wants you to live, that you want to live. But he requires certain things from you.
If somebody doesn't work, they shouldn't eat. Does that seem pretty harsh? Look at our government today. They're paying you not to work. They're feeding you. It's against God's word. Every able-bodied person should be out there working. And there should be an opportunity given to anyone that wants to work. Vayomer Adonai al Moshe, Red Ha'ed Ba'am Pen Yehersu, El Adonai Lirot Venafal Mimenu Rav. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. So people are pushing up against the barriers. They want to get a closer look. It's uh, John Lennon, it's uh, Paul McCartney, it's it's Bono, it's, uh, they want to get close to the star. It's Elvis. He sent Moses back to say, look, don't try to break through the barrier. God's gracious enough to send him down to remind the people, look, I put a boundary up, do not cross the boundary. In God's economy, one step over the line may take you one second, and it may take you a lifetime to return. I just had a tragic situation with somebody that I love dearly, whose sister has had a problem with drugs for 25 years. She took one pill, and she died. It was laced with fentanyl. One pill and she died. The family struggled for 25 years through therapy, got her straight, got her on the board, got things right, got things back with the family. 25 years. A source of sorrows and heartache for them. One pill. My daughter's fiance went to therapy went to a 10-month program, came out clean, sober, one pill, died. One, not a hundred, not a bottle, one. What's the lesson? One step over the line has consequences that can last a lifetime. Is God wrong for setting the plumb line? My friend, the CPA, there's a line that the IRS draws. Now, if you're like Nadia Comaneci, you all remember Nadia Comaneci, the great, right? Then you have the ability to lean and lean and lean and lean before you step over that line. And you'll lean as far as you can, won't you? So as far as you can see over that line, but you will never cross that line, will you? You'll never take one step past that line. You'll find every way to see what's on the other side, and if you can use it, you'll use it for the benefit of your client, but you will never cross that line. That line is called legal. You will never do anything illegal for the benefit of your client. But you'll find every possible loophole you work for Treasury. No, not you. Uh, uh, um, Joyce Bradley worked for Treasury Department. Okay, you're a auditor, actuary. Pensions. What? Pensions. Pensions. That's it. We have a pension for pensions. Begam ha kohanim. Hanigashim el Adonai, yid kadashu pen yifrutz bahem Adonai. And let the priest also who come near the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. Go down and warn the people, those who through rebellion, curiosity, or simple daring presumed to go up on the mountain without, would perish. The glory and greatness of God wasn't to be a matter subjected to scientific inquiry or a way to prove one's own manhood. The way you prove your manhood is by being obedient, 
attentive, a good listener, and your wife is right all the time, She's not. Most of the time. Most of the time. There we go. The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. Just because God called Moses and Aaron up did not mean that there was an open invitation for the whole nation to meet with God on Mount Sinai. By your mayor Moshe, El Adonai, Lo Yukul, Yukal, Ha'ama, Leolot, at Har Sinai. Kiata he adota, Banu lemor hagbel et haar bekidashu kashtu. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you charge the saying, Set bounds about the mountain and sanctify it. Bounds, boundaries. What is wrong with boundaries? America today wants to have free reign. Everybody can decide to do what they want. You know, there was a time when Israel was like that. It was during the time of the Seleucids, the Greeks. And the books that were being written at the time were written by Plato and Aristotle and by Socrates, or as many of you know him as Socrates. And all of it was about, if it feels good, do it. Each one of you is a God. Each one of you has self-control, self-will. Then we have these great psychologists. How many of you raised your child by Dr. Spock? That was the Bible of the 50s. The man had no children. A man had no children, he wrote the Bible on how to raise children. By your Mary love Adonai Lech Red Vealita Ata Veha Aron Imach Vehakonim Veham Haam Al Yehersu Leolat El Adonai Pen Yefrot's bomb. And the Lord said to him, Go get you down, and you shall come up, you and Aaron with you. But let not the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. Jason plays with the band. He's uh, played with many, many bands. But you know what? Can't go backstage without a pass. Can't get past security without a pass, even if you're in the band even if they know who you are, even if you are Paul McCartney, you can't get past security without a pass. There's boundaries. You could be the greatest Paul McCartney, look alike, sound like him, and walk through and say, I'm him, and try to pass yourself off, and there's plenty of them. How many Elvis impersonators are there? Do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord. The whole idea at Sinai was exclusion. Exodus 19 describes the awe and fear each Israelite must have felt at Mount Sinai. It's easy to think that this alone inspired them to a holy lifestyle. But the Bible says that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You read in James, if anybody lacks wisdom, they should ask for. To me, that's like Monopoly. You draw the little card that says, go to jail, go directly to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go back to where you started from and get a reverent fear for the Lord and then wisdom will come. It makes it sound like, well, if I lack wisdom, I'm just gonna get this huge download of wisdom. What if you are lacking? Wisdom, then you don't have a reverent fear of the Lord, do you? Now, if I lack wisdom about a, per a particular subject, a particular issue, and I'm confused, 
Yes, I should go to the Lord and the Lord will direct me to a passage of scripture. He'll direct me to a story in the Bible. He'll direct me. He'll give me a word, a word of knowledge. Because I put myself in a position to receive. We love our football, don't we? We love it when they take that ball and they throw it 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 and they throw it. it. But if there's nobody downfield with their hands up, there'll be nobody to receive, will they? And we just have balls flying in the air and landing on the grass. You have to put yourself in a position to receive. And if you don't run the play the way the play was called, you're going to be out of position. So yes, football playbooks are a metaphor for the Bible. And I can tell you that the Fellowship of Christian Athletes preaches this message to the students, to the players, that the playbook is a metaphor for the Bible. And if you want to be in right standing with the coach, be in right standing with the playbook. If you want to be in right standing with the, with the Lord, be in right standing with the playbook. Dr. Gary Kramer, a good friend of mine. Some of you know him as Coach Kramer. It's the message he brings to the students, to the players. You want to be right with the coach? Go by the playbook. You want to be right with the Lord? Go by the playbook. It's no different. And not everybody makes the cut, do they? There's some who are rebellious and they're arrogant and they think they can do it their way. And what happens? They get cut. They were a great player. They ran the 4 4, the, the, the 40 and whatever the fastest 40 is. And they had great hands and they did, but they didn't play by the playbook. Many today feel we need to get more of the thunder and fire and trembling of Mount Sinai into people as a way of keeping them from sin. Yet not 40 days from this, the whole nation would have had an orgy around a golden calf, praising it as the God that brought them out of Egypt. Not 40 days later, 40 is the time of testing, after being held back by barriers, after hearing the trembling, after feeling the earth shake, after hearing the booming voice of God, after hearing the shofar, after hearing the words and the call of the Lord on Moses and Aaron 40 days later, yesterday's earrings are today's golden calf. Doesn't take us long to forget. I ask people, what would you do if Jesus walked through that door right now? What would you do? Would you lay prostrate before him? Well, then get on your knees because he's here right now. Would you be speechless? Would you be awestruck? Well, you should be because he's here right now and his Holy Spirit's here right now. This house is sanctified and the spirit of the Lord fills this place and you are in holy ground. Not in a building. You're on holy ground. We've lost so much. And we've done it because of distraction, which is the enemy's number one tool. Vayered Moshe el ha'am vayomer alechem. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. Awe is one thing, the submission of the will is another. Israel had plenty of awe, but little submission of their will. 
Hebrews 12, 18 to 24 says clearly that under the new covenant, we come to a different mountain, that our salvation and relationship with God is centered at Mount, si at Mount Zion, not Mount Sinai. Sinai speaks of fear and terror, Zion of love and forgiveness. Sinai is in a dry desert, but Zion is the city of the living God. Sinai with all its fear and power is earthly, but the Mount Zion we come to is heavenly and spiritual. At Sinai, only Moses could come and meet God. At Zion, there's an innumerable company, a general assembly. Sinai had guilty men in fear, but Zion has just men made perfect. At Sinai, Moses is the mediator, but at Zion, Jesus is the mediator. Sinai put forth an old covenant ratified by the blood of animals. Zion has a new covenant ratified by the blood of God's precious son. Sinai was all about barriers and exclusion. Zion is all about invitation. Sinai is all about the law. Zion is all about grace. Therefore, we shouldn't come to Zion as if coming to Sinai. We must put away our hesitation and get bold in coming to the Lord. Even so, there's much for us to learn at Mount Sinai. We learn of God's holy requirements and what we have to do before we can come to him. In a similar manner to those at Mount Sinai, there are things we must do to meet with God. We must receive God's word. We must be set apart. We must be cleansed. We can only come after the third day. We must respect God's boundary. We must restrain the flesh. We must know we come to a holy God. Reader, art thou still under the influence and condemning power of that fiery law which proceeded from his right hand? Art thou yet afar off? Remember thou canst only come nigh by the blood of sprinkling, until justified by his blood thou art under the curse. Consider the terrible majesty of God. If thou have his favor, thou hast life. If his frown, death. Be instantly reconciled to God, for though thou hast deeply sinned, and he is just, yet he is the justifier of him that believeth in Messiah Yeshua. Believe on him, receive his salvation, obey, obey his voice and deed, and keep his covenant. And then shalt thou be a king and a priest unto God and the Lamb, and be finally saved with all the power of an endless life. Amen. All right, stand to your feet. Let me send you out with a blessing. <clears throat> In Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the children of Israel. He goes on to say in this way, I will put my name on them and I will bless them. Please bow your heads to receive the Aaronic benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance toward you and your families and give them peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus our Messiah. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Shalom.